in terms of style and aesthetics and form, he really did everything. He really grew from period to period, absorbed all of the currents of every historical moment that he was in. Uh, for example, when Cinema Direct uh, came along in the 1950s, he was very resistant to it. He said that all these people with all the fancy new cameras uh, weren't swimming towards any objective, they were just splashing around. And he says, just because you have synchronized sound and a lightweight camera doesn't mean you're accessing the truth. He was very resistant, but uh, as we know, he, after a few experiments in the 1960s, he came on board with um, Le 17e Parallel in, in Vietnam and uh, uh, produced his own kind of direct cinema together with Marceline Lauridon. Uh, a very interesting uh, kind, a kind in which his authorial stamp and his point of view, his perspective or their perspective was very clear and his own stamp was on it. Um, if we have to define what Evans documentary, uh, uh, what makes it distinctive, I would, I would list a dozen things. Um, and I don't know whether I can, but uh, uh, aside from this, this interest in politics, that I think even though uh, Histoire de Vent is considered by some to be uh, an abjuration of politics in a certain way. I don't think it is. I think it's a synthesis of his career, of his political interests and his cultural interests. Um, aside from his interest in politics, I think that there are many thematic interests that he really approached better than anyone else. Uh, work daily life, uh, production, uh, the production of the fundamentals of life, like water, uh, food. Uh, I think beyond his thematic interests, I think that he retained a lot of the interests of that he first awakened to in the avant-garde in, in Amsterdam in the 1920s. Um, uh, he was really a perfectionist around editing and provocative uh, visual and kinetic editing, for example. Um, I think that his sense of the modernist frame, the very bold and kinetic uh, frame, uh, stayed with him until the very end. He never got over his obsession with with cranes and construction equipment and and bridges and constructions and would uh, construct really uh, engaging and strong compositions of human development, human construction on the planet right until the end. So he never lost that. Um, I think that his passion for uh, social justice and ordinary people, uh, of struggles against poverty, uh, never, never left him. I think that Evans among European and North American filmmakers invented the solidarity film and in particular he was extremely prophetic in developing what we would now call the third world or post-colonial solidarity film with Indonesia Calling, uh, a film that is absolutely unique from 1946. He basically put in place what younger filmmakers have been doing ever since um, uh, lending their vision and their resources to artists, to filmmakers, to people living in the global south um, 
whether we're talking about Indonesia or Chile or Cuba or uh, uh, Mali or uh, China, uh, even other countries in in Africa and Asia who are represented in uh, some of the East German films like Song of the Rivers, uh, Algeria and uh, Cameroon and uh, India, West Bengal, for example. Uh, he pursued this th for the following um, 40 years and uh, a whole new generation that belonged to the new left in the 1960s uh, followed in his footsteps. Uh, I'm not saying that the filmmakers of the Global South uh, always followed his initiatives. I don't think that he invented um, third world solidarity film for them, but I think that on the part, he often called documentary the conscience of the cinema, and he realized that this was one of the things that European and North American documentary had to do immediately after World War II, and uh, he laid the groundwork for it. Yes and no. Um, I was working on uh, Joris Evans long before I developed my interest in um, queer cinema, in LGBT cinema, in sexual transgression in cinema. Well, perhaps n not long before. I was working as a critic for a gay community newspaper as I was writing on Evans. And I suppose I felt that the two domains uh, were entirely separate. Um, I don't think they are. Um, I think that political cinema, political documentary shares, crosses those boundaries, whether we're talking about class and poverty or whether we're talking about disenfranchised, disenfranchised sexual minorities. I think that the two areas uh, increasingly over the last decades have uh, shared a lot. Um, in terms of applying the grid of sexual transgression to evens, I think he belonged to an older generation of the old left, the old communist left, that considered sexuality uh, perhaps a bourgeois concern. Uh, the Bolsheviks introduced all kinds of sexual and gender-related reforms in the 1920s, and then under Stalin, Soviet society withdrew those reforms, whether we're talking about abortion or homosexuality or, uh, or women's equality. Uh, however, I think that Evans, much of Evans' work uh, after... Um, the 1940s can be considered proto-feminist. Uh, films like Die Windrose uh, are very important and completely unacknowledged in terms of their development of a, of a feminist uh, point of view before their time. Um, so it's very interesting from that perspective. I think Evans' work also is subject to an analysis as in terms of heterosexuality. Uh, quite a few of his films merge a kind of conjugal denouement with a political uh, denouement around poverty or class or class struggle. Uh, we were joking at lunch about how the Italian film is full of flirtations uh, between its peasant heroine and her, her boyfriend, uh, uh, and just as the, uh, I think it's the, the, the gas well flames as a climax to that episode of that film, uh, they hold hands and smile lovingly into each other's eyes. So for Evans, this kind of heterosexual bliss that he knew all too rarely, biographically speaking, or that he knew often biographically speaking, but seldom or 
not always developed into long-term conjugal relationships. There was something going on with him in which he he elaborated these cliches, uh, but at the same time, uh, in his own life, uh, was not following in them him himself in a certain respect. I mean, the 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 last shot of Power in the Land where the farmer's wife uh, smiles blissfully that she has fulfilled all of her lifetime desires because her electric oven works. Um, this kind of a sentimental cliche uh, leads us really to understand the ideology of heterosexuality on the left in the 20th century. And uh, there are many examples like that that we could talk about. And uh, um, I think a sharp critical eye around sexuality and uh, gender relations uh, helps understand Evans' work, even though they're not really the crux of his concerns. I chose Evans as a topic in 1975 when I was uh, embarking on my PhD at Columbia University. Uh, Eric Barno had been my teacher and my mentor there, and he really turned me on to documentary. He developed my uh, passion for documentary. I was also awakening to left politics, the new left, uh, the counterculture, uh, gay liberation at the time. I was a part of this perfect storm of social movements that were very current, not only in New York where I was studying, but around the, the world. We were very much inspired by um, May 68, by the social upheavals in the third world. Uh, Evans, for me, really embodied the promise of uh, left politics as it uh, applied to my discipline of film studies and my interest in documentary. Very little had been written about Evans he was sort of an unknown uh, uh, factor in film studies. His biography had come out in the late 19... autobiography, uh, The Camera and I, in the late 1960s, and I found that a very interesting book. So I took him on, even though many of his films were not available. Uh, I think maybe only two or three of them were available at the time, and I sought them out. I sought Evans out, and I interviewed him in 1976 and in Paris, and then I interviewed him again, I think, the year, the following year in Montreal when he came to show how Yukon moved the mountains. He was very encouraging and very uh, positive about my work, um, and... Um, so I pursued this, and as you said, I, I finished the dissertation in, in 1981. Um, by that time, uh, I had written 625 pages and had only covered the first 20 years of his career up until Indonesia Calling, 1926 to 1946, and I stopped there. But I continued writing on Evans throughout the 80s and the 90s, publishing little bits of the dissertation, publishing other little bits here and there. Uh, his career, his work, his oeuvre is really inexhaustible to me then as now. Uh, and he kept on working. He was bringing out Yu Kong as I was writing, and I found it very interested. My generation of the New Left was very inspired by uh, Mao's Cultural Revolution and uh, other revolutions in the Third World. So Yu Kong really hit the spot. And um, uh, in the 1980s, I was very interested when uh, Une Histoire de Vent finally came out in 1989. I, I couldn't believe that, that after such a long interval of frustration uh, that he'd been able to pull off such a major work uh, at the age of 90. So uh, I continued working on him on and off, although I was also developing other, many other interests. And when it came to the 21st century, I decided that we needed to assemble everything, uh, finish his oeuvre, and 
bring out a, a, a book that covered the whole of his career that incorporated my dissertation in a kind of authoritative, comprehensive study of his work. Well, politically speaking, uh, the New Left is also now a, a chapter of history. Uh, many people declared that history was over when the Soviet Union fell in 1989-1990, uh, that the left was dead, uh, that there was no uh, future for the kind of political movement that Evans always espoused. Uh, we've seen that this is not true. The popular movements of this century that are ongoing as we speak, whether we're talking about the student movement in Quebec, where I'm from, or whether we're talking about the upheavals we've been seeing over the last month or two in uh, places like India and uh, the Middle East. Um, uh, it is ongoing, and I think even uh, the political filmmaker would have felt completely at home in uh, the current era. So. Uh, his kind of old party politics, I think, are gone. There's, there can no longer ever again be a, a common turn. Um, uh, in fact, uh, um, a, a kind of hierarchical party organization is uh, that he uh, lived for for much of his career is no longer possible, I think, in today's world of social networking and other kinds of uh, social and popular movements. Uh, so I think we now have a responsibility to study the history of that, those utopias and, and those visions. And this is one of the things I'm doing through this uh, book project, dis studying the history dissecting the history of those dreams and utopias that Evans' works all embodied. It's a good question. Um, um, I think there are many answers to it, and Evans really, in the history of documentary, which he really encompassed. He really tried almost everything and he innovated many of the techniques and aesthetic forms that we now take for granted. Um, I think that um, um, he always absorbed what was current in the period in which he was living. Uh, for example, when I just brought out my book uh, two years ago, my collection of articles in, that included a long chapter, well, um, not only a chapter on Evans, but also a chapter on Emile, Emile D'Antonio, I was amazed that both of these two veterans of left documentary brought out as their last work an autobiographical uh, self-reflexive essay film almost in the same year that bear a lot of resemblance and there is this uncanny fact that both had their finger on the pulse of the 1980s. It's hard to believe that this 90-year-old man was so hip. It's a real uh, innovative and pioneering film of the 1980s, Une Histoire de Vent and uh, stands, uh, uh, makes an interesting comparison with Emile D'Antonio's uh, uh, Mr. Hoover and I, even though, to my knowledge, they never met. They might have met, but I don't think they were talking to each other. <laughs>